Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're really excited to welcome you today to today's session, Freedom Dreaming, Using Art and Storytelling to Reimagine Communities of Color in Nature Education, presented by Isla um, Tawhid and Deja Jones. My name is Emily, as I said, and I am the Conference and Communication Specialist for the National Star Alliance. Um, my colleagues, Christy and Betty, are here as well, and we're all here to help. So if you have any questions um, or issues or anything, please feel free to post in the chat, and we'll, we will be um, monitoring that and happy to help. Oh, give me one second. I am. There we go. Um, today's, today's session is really exciting for us. Um, both Izzy and, and Deja presented at the Nature Based Early Learning Conference in Cincinnati in July of this year, and their session, which they'll be sharing with you all today, was a hit. In the post-conference survey, there were many comments like this one you can see on the screen um, from attendees who found the presenters and the presentation to be of the highest quality. Um, we just couldn't deny the request to bring these speakers back, um, which is what brings us all uh, together here today. Um, in fact, in all the years that Natural Start has been hosting webinars, today's webinar had more registrants than any other webinar, which speaks to the incredible interest in um, today's topic. Centering equity and diversity in nature-based education is essential to ensuring that all children have access to high-quality education that includes nature and the environment every day. So we're so grateful to our presenters for being here to speak to that today. Um, we want to thank Izzy and Deja for joining us and for sharing their expertise. So I'll just briefly introduce um, both of them. Um, Izzy is a courageous advocate for teachers. She works towards change by creating safe spaces where people can let their guard down, express their true selves, and receive honest feedback. She is currently an assistant principal in the Bronx, New York, where she enthusiastically strives to create a mutually beneficial team that up uplifts both educators and students to experience curriculum that reflects the diverse background of students in the school community. Uh, Deja is a co-founder and teacher leader at Honeypot Montessori, a nature-based Montessori school set to open in Newark, New Jersey. I don't know if it's opened yet. I'm sure she'll, she'll share a little bit about that. Thumbs up. Yay. Um, she is also a doctoral candidate and early childhood education sociologist. She has worked in education and youth development within the city of Newark, New Jersey for approximately nine years in the areas of case management, program coordination, program facilitation, curriculum design, and classroom teaching. She is a member of the New York City Early Childhood Research Network, where she is conducting research with Bank Street Strauss Center for Young Children and Families investigating disparities in New York City preschool program ecologies, equitable referrals, and inclusive practices. I think we can agree these are both very impressive women. <laughs> and on that note, I am, I am more than happy to stop talking and hand the spotlight over to Deja and Izzy. Um, as a reminder, Please, if you have any questions or comments, use the chat, and we ask that you keep yourself on mute. Having your video on and off is up to you, um, but please keep yourself muted and utilize the chat for any questions. Thank you, um, and I will hand it over. Hi, everybody. I am thrilled. I, I have worked all day, like most of us, but I feel so energized right now just to be with all of you. So thank you so, so much. We know that educator time is um, precious and we don't have a lot of it. So the fact that you are spending this time with us, we cherish it so much and we value you. So thank you very, very much. Um, and Emily did such a great job introducing us. I don't even know, Deja, what else could we say about ourselves? Right, I think I think Emily covered it all. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I am based in uh, Newark, New Jersey. I wasn't sure if that was mentioned. Oh, okay. So yeah, I, I work in early childhood space. Um, I've been working in nature education for about two and a half years now. Um, my research is embedded in nature education. Um, and so I'll share a little bit more about that as we go further on the presentation. Mm -hmm. And yes, so my name is Isla and I go by Izzy. Please feel free to call me Izzy. Uh, everybody does, unless you're my dad. So Izzy is fine with me. And I am a new elementary school assistant principal. Um, 
Last year was my first year, and this is my second year. I am located in the Bronx. I see a lot of Queens Zoo people here, and I have been there, but I just want to give a shout out to the Bronx Zoo because everybody knows we go there four times a year, and it's magical every time. Um, background is not in uh, nature-based learning. I like to call myself an accidental eco girl. Uh, it just was a passion and it evolved. And um, so I'm going to, if you are not located in a nature-based school, if you are a public school educator like me, don't worry. I have tips for you. You're going to be a little brave and you're going to be a little rebellious, but we're going to um, get these kids out and experiencing nature. So uh, there are so many people here. Again, we love that, but it does make um, engagement a little less personable. So in the chat, please, if you can, jot down some of your earliest experiences with nature and we'll share some of them out. And Deja, I cannot see the chat, so I do need your help here. Okay. Oh, um, spending time with my grandparents on their farm. I think that's a lovely memory. Um, my great grandparents were farmers. And so as a part of my childhood, we would spend summers in the South, um, napping outside, hiking the Sandia Mountains. It's, it's going so fast. Going to the local nature center with siblings. I see snow. <laughs> I see camping trips, uh, wandering in the woods, petting the goats. I love animals, family camping trips, collecting potatoes out of the fields, picking plums at my grandparents' farm, catching gardener steaks in the backyard. So there's so many rich memories and experiences here. Um, and I love, and it's so diverse. Petting the goats at the Denver Zoo, a oh. robin that was seeing outside our apartment. Oh. <laughs> Camping, woods, play, always outside, summer camps. Yeah, elementary school, nature club, and gardening, accidentally eating spicy peppers. <laughs> my, okay. dad <laughs> my dad up. My dad waking me up in the night to go to the beaver dam. Oh wow. Playing so what I <laughs> what I um I love about all of these stories is that I feel like no matter where you're from, you do have an early experience with nature. And that's something that we hope to bring out in our presentation today is that all kids, no matter where they live, have an experience with nature. And so we're really trying to shape the conversation to talk about um, that experience, whether it's vastly different than maybe going to wake up and see beavers. Um, both Deja and I grew up in, I would say, urban environments. Um, we're both still located and our teaching experience are in urban environments. So we don't have rivers, like vast rivers and uh, forests and things like that. But our students do have some experiences with nature. And so we're gonna talk about how we can use those experiences to help them further dream and become even more liberated about environmental education. So yes, I, I think I spoke to this accidentally again, but so together again, we're going to talk about the way we represent and discuss communities of color. We're going to talk about how children engage in nature um, in the midst of environmental racism and framing our discussion with that asset-based language. We're not going to focus on um, this is, I, I hate this, I hear this a lot, like, there's no trees, right? These kids don't have any trees and they don't have grass, they don't have, they don't have anything and they have something. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the things that they do have and um, further their exploration, further their discovery and further their love for education. All right, okay. So, before we begin with any of that, we first have to acknowledge that environmental racism is real and it is a real thing. And um, just like other forms of oppression that we encounter and day to day, though we may not be the, um, the contributors to, or where we, we might not be the ones who are imposing the, the racism or the oppression on, um, not just children, but all communities of color and marginalized voices, we are participants in a system. And so we have to first recognize and acknowledge that this system exists. And so when I'm talking, when we're talking about environmental racism, 
we are we want to uh, base it on a recognition that the people whose lives are most disrupted by climate change and those who are uh, most likely to be affected even in the hurricane that's coming up now. I just was texting my brother in Florida, like, are you all right? Um, those who are most likely to die and be harmed by hurricanes, those who are most likely to experience heat waves, those who are most likely to experience poison water or have the highest rates of asthma, these are people who already have a marginalized identity due to race. And so just beginning there, just beginning with that recognition and that acknowledgement will then further help you to see um, more of the institution, the rules, the policies, the government changes that are often intentional. These things did not just come by accident. They were planned and they were purposeful. And so together, we will also be very deliberate and intentional on destroying and dismantling those systems. And I'm already uh, speaking as a group that we are going to do it because if you logged in, then you're one of my people. And if you're one of my people, we're gonna make sure we tear down some systems, all right? If you're with me, just say yeah in the chat. <laughs> and that way I know. Please, please like emote, emote vigorously, uh, chat wildly, gesture <laughs> emphatically, and we'll just act like we're in a room together. So as we acknowledge that environmental racism is a real thing and it really does impact people's lives, there's still the broader assumption that um, while nature is for everybody, there's an assumption that we all experience it the same. And so we do want to draw attention to addressing the nature gap, because although we all should have the ability to have clean drinking water, clean air, public parks, green spaces, biodiversity, the reality is that we don't, and there is an equal distribution of these resources depending on where you live. Um, and so, and that's largely due to uh, race, income, age. And so it was found that the U.S. has fewer forests, streams, wetlands, and other natural places where there's a high population of Black, Latino, and Asian American people. Um, and so I, I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, Trenton, New Jersey is the capital of New Jersey, which is ironically, you know, called the Garden State. But in my city, it's more of a um, it's more of an urban developed space. And so. You're very privileged if you have a backyard. You're very privileged if you have a front yard. And, you know, we have city parks, but they're severely underutilized. Um, I've spent most of my professional career in Newark, New Jersey, which is super dense and becoming highly overpopulated. Um, there's less green spaces. There's a lot of development happening. And so people are really being reduced to apartment style living. Um, loft spaces and even the natural parks that we've had they're becoming more concrete parks and so it's more about beautification of the parks um less about the green space and so because of that you can imagine what the the heat index in newark looks like um and then also just things like uh water you know newark has had its water crisis now for the past five years um and trenton new jersey has been longer um, and so just a, a quick statistic, uh, three-fourths of census tracts that large numbers of families of color with children live in nature-deprived places, while less than 40% of white families with children do. And so that leads us to a, a much larger question is when we're talking about environmental studies or environmental education, who is uh, create, who's doing the research, who's sharing the narratives of people of color? Because you know, there is an absence of us in these spaces. Um, urban environments, they're heavily criticized for promoting nature deficit due to gentrification, um, redevelopment, and it's also attributed to child nature disconnectedness with the increase of technology. Um, and so what we really wish to see further in nature uh, education and nature studies is the intersection of not just nature and child development, but also nature and race. Um, and how currently we have a very um, ecocentric, Eurocentric narrative of what, what exists currently in nature. And so that's one of the things that I've been doing in my research is just looking at how Black children are experiencing nature and letting that be truth um, and letting that not just be a, a subcategory of 
environmental education, but this is a reality for these children. And this is how they're experiencing nature and it doesn't make it any less environmental education. Very good. And so um, today, as Deja pointed out, when doing her research or when you're um, reading more scholarly texts, you do come across a lot of narratives that we feel are very untrue. Um, Black people and people of color are not ecophobic. Uh, Black people and people of color are not disconnected from the love of nature. Um, and then the reason why we have to challenge these assumptions is because not only are they harmful, but they can become uh, violent, as we saw with the um, young Black man who was out bird watching and then got the cops called on him because people are so shocked <laughs> to see, right? Like a Black bird watcher, who would have ever thought? But Black people enjoy nature, Black children enjoy nature. And so we're going to tell you some ways that you can use storytelling and what we call freedom dreaming to kind of further that narrative and make it more accessible to all children. And so freedom dreaming, and so freedom dreaming, it sounds like such a whimsical word because who doesn't love freedom? And who doesn't love freedom more than children, right? And then dreams, you know, we dream about anything we wanna do, anything we wanna be. And so I love the act of freedom dreaming. It is very much um, a word that is coined and rooted in social justice and advocacy. Um, Robin D.G. Kelly uh, wrote the book, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. And in this book, and I recommend everyone read it, but in this book, she really draws on some of the, the greatest movements, uh, civil rights movements of our past, and how before these movements were actualized, they were a part of somebody's imagination, right? Someone woke up and said, there's something in this world that I don't see for myself or for my people, and I want to see it here now. And so it starts in the mind, it starts with visualizing this world that we want to live in, and then we become, then we um, determine the actions that will take us to get there. And so when we think about freedom dreaming in nature education and urban communities, sometimes we like, sometimes we get caught up in the deficit model. We frame it in what don't we have? You know, what, what can't we do? What doesn't exist? What's not here? But we forget what is here, right? And we forget what's here because of what someone else has done to get it here. And so we want to take a moment to really think about what are our freedom dreams in nature, right? If we can have this beautiful green world where everything is clean and accessible, like what would that look like? And then what will we need to do to get that there? So how do, what do we do as educators, as nature educators to really um, expose children of color, black children to nature in any living context? And so we think about storytelling. Children love stories. I love stories. I'm an avid reader. I read all the time. Um, I always say opening up a book and getting lost in it is a, a really cheap and affordable vacation because you get to escape for a little bit. You get lost in the characters, the plot. You find some places where you can relate to characters. And so children are automatically drawn and attracted to stories. They like to tell them. And sometimes you can't get them to stop once they start. <laughs> they love to tell you every single thing about their day, what they're doing, what, your, what their parents are doing, the caregivers are doing. And so children love stories. And so what better way to connect with them than stories about nature? Um, sometimes children use stories to really um, draw out abstract uh, concepts. And so they might be experiencing something that they're not able to give language to yet. And so sometimes stories really helps them relate to those experiences. It helps them understand their relationships to nature um, and not as something as I'm, I'm on the outside of this, but I'm also a part of this. And so children are nature. Um, and for many children who participate in place-based education programs, and so if you're in communities that are um, heavily urbanized, so like Newark, um, where you don't have a lot of parks or green spaces or wetlands, um, storytelling is a great way to transport children to those spaces. Um, Hannah said, I love the nature anatomy book. I do too. <laughs> I love the illustrations. 
And so um, having access to these stories, they're a great bridge and they're a great way to really help children define what nature might look like in their, in their communities. Um, another great way to freedom dream is through reflective art practices. Um, I love to draw. I'm not that great at it, but I love to do it anyway. <laughs> Sometimes if I, if I need to refocus myself, I'll doodle in a notebook. Um, and so drawing is a great way for us to communicate. And so as a researcher working with small children, um, it's a great way for me to really see what a child's perspective is. And so what are they thinking about this concept or this word or this place? Why did they use these colors instead of this color? Why did they draw these people instead of that person? And so what are their pictures communicating to me? Um, and how can I use these stories? How can I use these images as um, a grounds for a story or a discussion? And so drawing is considered a form of communication. Um, it helps us uh, collect all types of information. Um, it helps us foster a stronger connection to nature when we can actually put those images in our mind onto a sheet of paper and look at it. And then art is also just super developmentally appropriate for children. You know, children love to doodle, they love to draw, they love to come up with all different things. You'll always see a house or a tree in their pictures. And so that lets me know that to them, a shelter and trees, they understand are an important thing to have. Yes, Hope says drawing is also a window into English language learners, and that is very true. Um, and so I wanna share just some narratives that I was able to collect from some children that I work with. Um, and so I did a study last year where I wanted to collect narratives of children's experiences in nature. And so one of the books that I read was Michelle's Garden. And I got a chance to speak with a little girl named Eva. She lives in Woodbridge, Virginia. And she was super, interested in this book and so I took a stack with me and I let her pick out a book and I wanted to know why she picked Michelle's Garden out of all the other books that I showed her um and so I learned that her and her mom garden all the time like it's something that they do it's something that builds that relationship between them and it builds the connection between mother and daughter and so for a seven-year-old, she was very knowledgeable about the tools that you would need to start and cultivate a garden. And so that let me know that this is something that is very um, consistent in her life. Um, Woodbridge, Virginia, um, if you're not familiar with the area, um, it is really close to Arlington. Arlington is becoming very developed because of its close proximity to DC. But Woodbridge is a little bit more suburban. And so you get a mix, um, you get a mix of urban, you get a mix of suburban. Um, and she lives in a community that is very suburban. Um, and so for her, her freedom dream, um, and I, I think we'll see her picture a little bit later, her freedom dream was to actually have more playgrounds and more parks in her community. And so while having access to nature in the stands, um, gardening and forest and camping and hiking, she wanted a little bit more um, of the playful sides of nature, of having a, a city or community park with playgrounds. She wanted to do the monkey bars, the jungle gyms is uh, what she said to me. And so you get to see um, what these children know, what they want to know, what they want to do. Let me go to the next slide. And so this is Eva's drawing. Um, it's a picture of her and her mom on swings at a playground. And for her, even though she spends a great deal of time outside gardening and riding her bike, she wants more parks and more playgrounds. Um, they live about 40, they go to a park about 45 minutes from their house. And this is actually a park that is um, more urbanized. So it's less green spaces at this park. It's more concrete. And then there's a lot of uh, swings and slides and jungle, jungle gyms. And that's what she likes to do. And so I thought that was interesting when I asked her uh, what she wanted to see in terms of nature in her community. And then I got to go to Manhattan and speak with two sisters, um, Kenya and Aaliyah. We read a book called The Hike. They picked The Hike because Hiking is something that they do a lot with their mom. Um, they travel from Manhattan um, to other parts of New York to find hiking trails. And so the two narratives that they shared, um, I've gone on lots of hikes. I went on a hike a few days ago. Whenever I go on hikes, I like to take snacks and bars with me in case I get hungry. 
one time I got lost on a hike. I was with my mom and then my mom didn't know which way to go, but I saw we were on the blue trail and then I saw a tree with tape on it. So I told her we had to go that way. And so Kenya, uh, Kenya was five at the time. And so these are some of the memories that she makes with her mom um, and her sister because they go together. Um, Aaliyah, she's more of a scenic person. She loves to go on the nature walks and she likes to take pictures of the trees, the flowers and the animals. And for her, when she gets lost, it is a very tra traumatizing experience for her. And so she sort of leans on her older sister, Kenya, to help them get back to where they, they were going. And um, they were able to pick out that experience because there's a portion in the book where the three girls who were hiking actually ended up getting lost. And so that was a moment in the book that stood out to them um, when we were having our discussion. And so this is Kenya's reflective art. And so living in Manhattan, they live in apartment style buildings um, where they don't, have, uh, they don't have parks in their neighborhoods. And they were telling me that the playground that they have is very small. And so this is Kenya's freedom dream. She drew a picture of a greenhouse with flowers and butterflies because it's something that she envisions for her neighborhood. Um, and so while she does not have gardens in her neighborhood, she desires to have them in her neighborhood. And so when we're working with children in the classroom and we see things like this, or we hear the things that they want, I think it really prompts me as an educator to think about how can I bring these experiences to children when they don't have them in their day-to-day -day life? And so what can we do to help Kenya have more garden experiences and more, um, more experiences with butterflies and being able to just be outside and, and playing and exploring in nature. So before we go to that next slide, like Deja, I presented with you, clearly, you know, I know your research, but every time I'm always so touched because it's that one step, like it, again, participants, I know you're with me. If an educator doesn't take that one extra step that Deja took, which is just asking the kids a question, what do you dream of? And giving them that chance to express it, you would never know. That is how we end up with those deficit narratives is because we're not having these conversations with children and we're not creating these spaces for them to dream. So thinking of that, right? Because of, I'm already thinking, thinking of that, um, if you can take some time and either in the chat, and I don't know, Emily, if this is a risk, but if a few people raise their hand, we could pick one or two to talk about the ideas flowing through their heads. How are you thinking about centering voices in the margins to create a culturally inclusive conversation about the environment in your learning spaces? What are some things that maybe are coming up for you now? Um, some thoughts that you're having, ponderings, wonderings, musings. Again, the chat is always free and a few brave souls who wish to raise their hand, please feel free to do that also. And Emily can unmute you. And Deja, could you help me with the chat? Thank you. And it is a big question and I'm very comfortable with wait time. I was an elementary school teacher for 16 years. I, I could do this. We do have one person who um, has raised their hand. Okay. Okay. If you would like to share. <coughs> Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this uh, brilliant presentation. I'm enjoying every moment of it. Thank you. Uh, and, and this is such a great question. I just want to add my two cents that uh, as much as we as educators can create the experiences for the children, we if we can center the students' voices in what kind of experiences attract them the most, mm -hmm. and even in terms of solutions, for all the issues that they are facing. Uh, I recently did a project with a couple of families where the kids were thinking about how to take math outdoors and how to engage with math in the outdoors. And, and, uh, and I was just amazed by the ingenuity, by, by, the, by, by how, 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 how great and how innovative kids can be. So, so yeah, that's, that's my two cents in terms of how do we really give them the voice and the choice 
to the children to come and and, and talk about these issues. Thank you. Right. Snap for this man because voice <laughs> and choice are the key words there. That is what's going to be life changing. That is going to be the most freedom giving, right? It's that center students voice and then give them the choice. Thank you so much. We have a, another person who is raising their hand. I'll ask them to un unmute. Hi. Hi. So, um, I, I work at a nature center um, in Wisconsin and we've had these conversations um, for, it's been part of the strategic plan of the nature center for the last five years. And, and, and what's become very clear is that just having the, the interest in doing it isn't, isn't enough. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a, if you build it, they will, whoever they is, will come to, to your programs. And that it's become very clear that it's got to be um, way, way, way more intentional and um, kind of Boots, boots on the ground and mm -hmm. providing and transportation has always been a huge, a huge barrier. So providing transportation, providing the, the gear for kids to wear when they come so that they, they can play in nature and not get, not, not get their clothes dirty and, you know, their clothes if they're going home to a household that doesn't have laundry facilities in their home, things like that. Um, and, you know, I guess I don't have any answers, but I'm, I'm pleased that this year we, we hired an inclusion specialist who actually isn't just somebody who's thinking about policies and more, if you build it, they will come, but is actually somebody who's come from the schools and has a, um, has been a school social worker and a liaison, a homeschool liaison, and, and is actually out there talking, talking to families and talking um, and going out on outreach into the community and getting to know all of our programs to, to really, to really be more be more inclusive in all ways. Mm, thank you. Susie, where are you um, located? I'm in Wisconsin. So Matt, near outside of Madison, Wisconsin, we're just in a bedroom community, Monona. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. I thank you everyone that was brave and participated in the sharing. And I, I do see this in the chat and it's like Victoria read my mind because I'm definitely about to talk about Dr. Goldie Muhammad um, in my next slide. So hold on there, Victoria. See, I don't know how many times I'm going to say this. I'm telling you, these are my people. So what now, right? Our minds are filled with ideas and questions. And so now we're thinking, what now? What can I do tomorrow with students? What can I say tomorrow to educators? Or why even wait for tomorrow? Tweet it out tonight. Um, and I like to begin with discovery. So ask and invite questions. Here's that dreaming that Deja was talking about. When you are when you are leaning into discovery, you are giving that uh, choice and voice. You are centering students' ideas and the things that they're wondering about. And you're giving them that space to dream of new worlds but also to be critical of the world that they already live in. So what is, you, this takes some internal work. This takes a little bit of reflection because you have to think as an educator, what is your goal for education? Is it to create a new world? Do you want to actually make that world that the children are thinking of happen? And if so, then you need to be critical of the world that they already live in. And so someone in the chat already uh, mentioned, but I am a huge Dr. Goldie Muhammad fan. Um, she tweeted me one time and I just read her books and I love her, but she speaks about criticality and being critical of, again, the problems that already exist. So she speaks of criticality as understanding power and oppression and equity in order to promote anti-oppression. And she defines oppression as anything that harms. So going back to when we talked about environmental racism, whose lives are more likely to be disrupted by hurricanes? Whose lives are more likely to be disrupted by heat waves, poison water, right? Think 
the access to, um, Susie spoke about her students' access to nature. Before I jumped on this call, I was talking to my dad. My dad's 70 years old. And we were talking about how uh, hard it is to go from uh, Newark where we live, or even um, if you're in certain sections of the Bronx or Brooklyn or Queens to the beach because of how Robert Moses and other urban planners made the roads low so people who ride buses can't go there, right? That's not a mistake. Why so many black people cannot swim? They they would rather fill the, the pools with concrete than let them be integrated. Like these problems happen intentionally. And so if you, when you're doing discovery with your students, you have to provide the framework where you're telling them the truth and you're telling them you're you're interacting with nature, but saying to yourself, are all students having the same experience that we're having? Is everyone able to have the same experience we're having right now? And if they are not, telling them why. So this is the discovery part. It's really about being critical, making observations, identifying an issue, and then together you can move on to collaboration. So this is where you're taking on an environmental justice issue. And you're really thinking about um, your partners. And so one way to disrupt um, anti-oppression when you're thinking about, about collaboration is one, this is gonna sound very obvious to most of you here, is including the environment as your teacher. You are learning with nature, not just from nature. We are uh, not just on the earth, but we're living in the earth. We are together. So the, the nature and the earth has to be our first and foremost collaborator, right? We are not just using nature as a resource, but as a, as a, a third member in our discovery process. And then shifting away from just the sole uh, USA focused ran of environmentalism and going global. Um, Earlier this summer, I did a workshop where I talked about Africa at the forefront of the environmental movement. And um, if you are aware with the culture um, of Ghana, the Ghanaian culture, they have these symbols called Adinkra symbols and they're beautiful, you can Google them. But one of them is called uh, Asaye Yuduro and it means the earth has weight. And it's this beautiful symbol with two hearts, like one on top of the other to show a balance between human beings and the earth, because again, you're having that collaboration. And so when you look back on black and indigenous cultures and how they have been stewards of the earth forever, you can learn so much more and your discovery can become so much uh, richer when you're including these voices. Uh, here in Brooklyn, there's a project called Sustainable Brooklyn. And um, one of the girls, Whitney, said that if you are not including the contributions of those fighting for Black and Indigenous liberation, then you don't really have a climate movement. You don't really have climate justice if you are keeping those voices out. So thinking about collaboration, expanding outward, looking globally, because uh, unfortunately, a lot of people um, on different continents, such as Africa and South America, were forced to, to become environmental activists, not just because um, of interest, but because of necessity. When, when their lands were colonized and their resources were stripped away, they had to dig into ingenuity. They had to dig into empowerment. They had to dig into um, the, the genius that lived within the, the community to come up with new ways of doing things. And so exposing students to these ways, learning more about, learning more yourself will really help make those um, discoveries and collaborations in your classroom all the more rich, okay? And then lastly, my last step is get into action. It's time to work. So uh, Ugandan activist, uh, Vanessa Nakate, she said, not all climate action is climate justice. And that, I love it. I want it on a shirt. Um, what is the work? What is What are the actions that we're actually taking? Are they changing the world? So I really believe in um, making it public, right? Teaching students that having access to nature is a human right. So having your students speak about it, go on social media campaigns, writing, make it public. Again, my people in New York, I have been um, working with the botanical gardens uh, in the Bronx as my students do projects and saying like, can we display this project here, right? I was very old. I'm older than you think. I was very old before I even thought about 
my uh, outreach beyond my classroom. I just thought like I have these 20 whatever kids here, sometimes 33, and this is it. Like these, these are my people. But teaching them and teaching myself that, that what we have to say should be heard by others and making it public. So we begin to do um, renewable uh, bag campaigns. We begin to make go in our neighborhood. When Deja talked about place-based pedagogy, that is so, so important. Like, please don't think that where you live is not important because you don't have a, a park up the street or a river in your backyard. Learn about the place you're on. What indigenous land are you on? What did the what did this land look like before we got here? And really teaching the students about the history of it and saying we have the power to restore it back. To, and writing those letters, making blueprints. Um, I'm going to share some other projects that Deja did in Newark with gardening, but really making the students know that you don't have to wait to grow up to change the world. You can do it right now. Your voice right now is important, and I'm going to help you with that. Now, like I said, I always was a Department of Education teacher. Did I break the rules and go off the curriculum sometime? Yes but look at what it got me. They promoted me to assistant principal. So don't be afraid. <laughs> you, can, you can do this. Um, there's several parts in, in the UNICEF study that we've done where I just turned it into an environmental project. For example, we had to study the sun, moon, and stars. We do expeditionary learning in my school, and the first grade unit is on the sun, moon, and stars. And we can read the books, and it's great, but you can go outside and ask kids to look in the sky. Do you see the sun? Yes. Do you see the moon? Sometimes. Do you see the stars? Not really. Why is that? We got into a whole discussion about air pollution, light pollution, right? Um, we began to do some letter writing campaigns and we raised money in our school to get this like fancy telescope where the kids can then stargaze and we had this whole community night. So there are things that you can do within your curriculum if you're a little brave and you're a little rebellious and you really, again, center that student's voice and choice. And Deja, you want to talk about my kiddo? By the way, you friends, I might live in New York, but Deja works in my hometown, so... <laughs> Yes, and, and me and Izzy actually met um, during undergrad In so years ago, and it's so funny because um, Izzy was actually my mentor when I came into undergrad, and so I was just a freshman, and she was a graduating senior. Don't and, tell these people that. We're the same. We're the same. Age. <laughs> and yeah. so all these years later, like we we it's like full circle. Um, and we're now we're working together in education, two different states, but still connected. Um, and so part of what I've been doing for the last few years, um, I've really been thinking about just how we're including Black children, Brown children in environmental spaces. And I really wanted to think about how do we include them without putting the burden on them to be problem solvers of the environmental crisis that adults have created, you know? And so I, I find that in some, like the, the marginalization of environmental studies is on one end, we get the narrative of children who live in more affluent communities who have these beautiful, whimsical experiences in nature. Um, and completely, um, I guess there's like a veil over their eyes of the realities of children in more marginalized communities. But when we get to children of, of color, we're giving them the rundown on environmental racism. We're telling them about environmental justice uh, and they're a part of the environmental justice movements. Um, and then we're also placing on them this obligation to be a problem solver of these things. And so it's like, why can't they also have, you know, these innocent nature experiences, um, especially working in early childhood spaces where children's first interactions with nature will pretty much determine how they come to feel about it. And so, you know, we have issues of uh, echophobia where children are afraid to be outside. Um, children are afraid of nature. They're afraid of animals. They're afraid of insects, and it's because they've never had the opportunity to build that connection. And so part of what I did with storytelling is read a story, uh, Jaden's Impossible Garden. So he lives in a city much like New York City, and he believes that there's nature everywhere, but the adults in his life do not, and they're just, there's no nature here. And so he's determined to find nature wherever he can find it, whether it's a squirrel in the tree, 
or he finds a nest of eggs right outside his window. But then he connects with a, a elder in his community who has these experiences and they build this bond and they bring this totally new version of nature and environmentalism to their community by creating a garden in an empty lot. And it's the same thing with Harlem Grown. And Harlem Grown is actually based on a real uh, experience. Um, Harlem Grown is actually a real garden in Harlem. They actually have several gardens throughout um, that borough or that part of uh, New York. And so one of the things that I did with children um, at McKinley School in Newark, um, we started a garden from the ground up. And so we took an empty school lot, a schoolyard, a courtyard, and we brainstormed, how can we make this into a garden space? And so we had to buy the beds. Um, children, they learn how to start seeds in the classroom and seedlings and transplant the seedlings. They learn how to cultivate. They learn how to mix the soil and the manure. They were completely, uh, they were completely uh, <laughs> tripped out about cow manure. And it's just like, it doesn't have a smell, but everyone's like, ew, like, <laughs> and so that was like a highlight. And we were able to end the school year with a school garden. We actually had a spring festival to end the school year where children were able to harvest some of the, the lettuce that they grew. They were able to harvest some of the peas and the beans and make a salad and actually taste the things that they grew. And then I worked with preschoolers at Harriet Tubman in Newark. We read Lola Plants a Garden. And as you can see, the children in the pictures, uh, we're breaking up the soil because th this was an old bed in, in their school garden that hadn't been used in a very long time. And so we wanted to revive the garden space. And so the children, they're breaking down the soil. We're pulling out weeds. And they were able to do a pea garden um, as well. And then we also had some third graders who planted lettuce and they were able to uh, do a lettuce harvest um, at the end of the year. And they were able to make a salad. We did like this whole competition um, called uh, Junior Master Chef where children were using some of the produce from the garden to come up with their own recipes. And it was very fun. Um, they were able to include their parent guardian in the experience with them. And so it, it was a fun experience. And so these are just some of the ways that we are able to take action. We are able to beautify our community, but we're also able to provide fresh produce for families and the children who belong to these schools um, free of charge. Yes, we love to see it. <laughs> so um, this is our conclusion. We are going to open up for Q&A. Again, the questions can be in the chat or um, Oh my gosh, I was about to use elementary school language. If you raise a quiet hand, if you raise a quiet hand, we're calling you. While we're um, looking at the questions, I do want to share a resource page. So it's going to be a link in the chat. I might have to unshare my screen a little bit to do that, um, where I have a toolkit here for you, along with the book collection. And then other um, links to Deja's amazing research. Please look out for her. She's going to be a star. She already is. And ways to contact us. So all of this is going to be in the link that I dropped in the chat. Okay. All right. I'm going to go back to here. And again. Yeah. Um, I'll also share an additional link. And so um, Izzy has a lot of resources for uh, children. Um, I have some books, like a book list for adults, if you are interested in reading um, about things like environmental racism or housing justice or food justice um, and how to address these issues. And so this is more of um, adult literature that I can share. I'll drop that in the chat as well. You know, I have a million links, right? Oh, look at it, here I found it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. And, and um, if you two are comfortable with it, um, we can share any resources you're willing to share directly from the Natural Start website as well. We can link to, to your resources along with the recording of this webinar. Okay. And I know a lot of people have asked for slides and if you're willing to do that, that's great. Um, mm -hmm. But I also know, you know, you've put a lot of work in into this. So um, only, only if you're comfortable sharing, that's completely your call. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, consideration. Um, let's see. So yes, any hands and uh, questions in the chat? Social justice books, I agree. I use that 
of, of yeah. time. I really love that site. It's great. Okay, so I see one. Um, the first question is Austin. Oh, this is not a question. This is someone that is relating to you, Deja, about students' fear of nature. They're always like, are there snakes here? <laughs> that too, but I'm like, guys, we're in the Bronx. I'm more afraid of the rats. What are you saying to me? <laughs> no snakes. <laughs> rats a lot. Yeah. I've actually come to not be afraid of, of rats. Girl, no, I, I, haven't. Up, I was terrified, but working in gardening... You'll see rats in gardens a lot. And so now I'm just like, okay, well, the little little rat, and it's not that it's not traumatic. It's not little. <laughs> well, they're they're puppy size rats, but still. <laughs> okay, sorry, Emily. I know this took a turn. You were not No, I, I'm I'm just thinking the same thing over here. I'm in Chicago. We've got the rats. <laughs> I see them. Uh -uh. Um I actually have um, a question for you, Deja. Um, with the start of your your program, did you say it did, the Honeypot did um, launch? Yeah, we're open this year. All so exciting. Um, so with, um, it, it sounds like you've worked with elementary schools and some early childhood centers to get um, gardens set up, but I'm wondering if there's something that you're particularly excited about implementing within your own program. Yes, so one of the partnerships that we're currently solidifying is with uh, Turtleback Zoo, which is a small zoo here in um, West Orange, New Jersey. They have early childhood programming where will be able to learn about animals in real time. And so I'm really excited about being able to take the children to Turtleback Zoo or having Turtleback Zoo come to us with animals and children can actually learn about them, but then also experience them in real time. Um, and the gardening program is also a part of our curriculum. Um, we're teaching the children how to start gardens, how to sustain a garden, and families will have access to the produce that's grown in the garden. That's great. Um, I'm wondering too, um, I feel when when we talk about this work, a lot of times um, the importance of establishing relationships within the community is, is really emphasized. Um, I wonder if you have any, I don't know, just anything to share from your own experiences about the best way to sort of go about that, any advice, any stories, you know, anything like that about um, establishing those relationships so that it really feels like a community-based program? Um, either of us? Either, yeah. either. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, again, I am in New York, so I have so much access to people who are doing the work. Um, again, I'm in the Bronx, so we have the Bronx Zoo, we have the Botanical Garden, we also have um, the Bronx River Alliance, like wherever there is, like find where there is uh, an abundance of nature and there's people who are taking care of it. So those are big organizations, but then there are usually people in the community with smaller community gardens, even something simple as the person you see always sweeping in front of their apartment building. Uh, these people usually have um, like a richness of knowledge, especially when you're talking about that place-based pedagogy, like tell me about this place and how has it changed and what was it before and how are you taking care of it? Uh, so you have to be a little not shy. <laughs> you don't have to be Izzy, but you have to be like not, not shy and talk to people and um, they'll usually hook you up. So there, there is a person, swear hand to God, this is a real story that like shakes the rats. <laughs> out the garden for me because they know I'm afraid. I'm sorry, Deja. I'm still, I'm still afraid. So he comes, he shakes the rats out the garden for me. And then me and the kids go and we do our thing. Um, so really, again, just re reaching out to organizations that, that exist, um, specifically looked for people of color-based organizations, and then um, your local community. Yeah, and I would say the same. There's organizations, in, and I wouldn't say in every community, but I know particularly in um, Newark where I'm at, we have the Nature uh, Conservancy, the Greater Newark uh, Conservancy, which is our nature hub. Um, we also have the Office of Sustainability um, within City Hall. And we have um, so many other environmental justice movements in a lot of urban farms. 
And a lot of them get, they get thousands of dollars a year to do youth programming, but they don't actually have youth, um, like the capacity for youth programs. And so they're always looking for ways to partner with um, schools, community, uh, other community organizations to really uh, use those funds for what they're intended to be used for. Um, I know particularly um, there's an organization called Food Corps. I had the opportunity working with them last year, but they are a million dollar organization. They're, um, they are actually a national organization and they go into schools and they teach nutrition um, and food education. And they also help students um, in schools start gardens. And so they're always looking to partner with uh, science teachers or any health teachers in schools who are interested in uh, urban gardening, who are interested in um, food programs for the school. And so it's just tapping into that money that's just sitting and not being used. And so I think that um, that's something that's also really, uh, really cool to like search for is, okay, is there money out here and where is it and how can I use it and who can I partner with to get access to it? Thank you both. Uh, oh, someone, um, Anne asked a question in the chat and this will be our last question. Um, Anne says, um, the Portland, Maine public school, small but incredibly diverse school system, rapidly growing over 70 languages spoken in the in 17 schools. The district has a remarkable district-wide full-time outdoor learning director in her second year. The district now has garden coordinators at the school to support culturally responsive, equitable outdoor learning in the district. What else would you recommend for the city um, as they journey supporting this work? Deja, do you want to go first or me? I don't care. Big, big thoughts there, I guess so. <laughs> so, go ahead. I was going to say first, I think it's great that the district has outsourced um, people to actually tackle this work. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think, uh, I think one of the things that, that makes work like this invisible is people don't know about them, right? Just like with Newark, there's a million gardens in Newark that's offering produce, but there's so much food waste in Newark because people don't know about it. And so I think it's building a marketable capacity and just being able to like be visible within like smaller cities, um, and not just, um, not just staying like, I guess, isolated to a specific, uh, like demographic, but actually like putting foot to pavement. I'm a grassroots person. So I like to just go and ask questions and build those connections in person. And what can I do to help and what, what I need help with. And so I think that's the best way to really, um, expand on things like that. Yeah. And I like the the word that stood out to me was culturally responsive, right? Culturally responsive, equitable outdoor learning. And I have to go back to, you know, our homie Amit, where he said center student voice and student choice. So um, what Deja spoke about, about giving the kids a chance to, to dream first asking the kid, I would do, I don't want to do this lady's job, but <laughs> I would, I would have a um, activity at the beginning of the year to see what do kids already know? How can we tap into their funds of knowledge, especially if there are students with 70 different languages, right? That global reach, what, what kind of um, uh, values and what kind of interactions do they have from their homelands that they can bring into the school system and how can we build off those funds of knowledge? What type, what do they already know about um, environment, environmental justice, our relationship with the land, and then what do they wish to see? And how could we realistically and reasonably and within the school budgets make that dream happen? I really feel like tapping into the kids and their families would be step one for me and then building from there. Thank you both. And and of course now, you know, everyone's like their questions are triggered now as we're wrapping up. Um, but uh, not enough time for more questions. I'm sure people could would love to pick both of your brains. Um, and I, I hope you're you're seeing um, all the nice comments in the chat about how um, everyone is really grateful for you 
for taking the time today, but also just for everything that you're doing on a daily basis. So thank you. I want to echo that. Um, and actually, um, Izzy, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to share my screen just again to just wrap up. Whoop. There we go. Uh, okay. Um, a little clunky there. Thank you both again so much. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Before we wrap up, um, I just want to sort of scramble and take a moment to share a couple of other professional development opportunities that Natural Start is offering to all of our um, conference registrants. So we've scheduled three bonus live sessions that will air on select Wednesdays in October and November. So you can see when those are coming up. And if anyone, um, if you are interested in these and you're not registered for the conference yet, um, we'd encourage you to do so. You get access access to these and then you also get access to the whole library of um, on-demand sessions and that that access lasts until July of next year so lots of time to watch if you have any questions at all um, about this any questions really to we can always um, follow up with Izzy and Deja and see if there's anything else um, if they have more time to answer questions via email I'll check in with them about all of that um, but we just we just really thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and again, one more, please, thank you for our wonderful presenters today. We're so, so appreciative um, to, to share all of this um, important work at the end of a long work day um, is, is we're just so grateful. So thank you. And the recording along with the resources that um, they've created will be shared at naturalstart.org and we'll send an email out to everyone when that is posted. So um, thank you again. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening and the rest of your week. Bye everyone. Thank you, bye. Thank you.